but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this unfaithful and sinful generation, the human one will be ashamed and of that person when he comes of the Father, glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Inga. There is a situation that has tended to happen a lot over the last two years, and this is a phenomenon of being the youngest person, or at least the youngest adult in the room. Now, in case anybody wondered, I'm 34 years old, and goodness, part of me cannot believe I'm saying that. <laughs> but in the church world, I still might as well be a baby. I'm a very young person in this vocation. And one of the many consequences of that is that my vocabulary is often very different from those around me. It has become even more pronounced since I moved to Montana. <laughs> right now, of course, I have all the Texanisms that um, don't always translate super well. I use a lot of pro wrestling terms in my everyday life that I forget that most people don't know. And then there are just the words and phrases and sayings that I use as a young person who spends way too much time on Twitter and Instagram and more and more TikTok. God help me. <laughs> so for people that are older than me, especially much older than me, I feel like some, most of the time I might as well be speaking Swahili. <laughs> I know you actually speak Swahili, so <laughs> you would know. One of those terms that is familiar to me that I have come to realize recently that people over 40 have no idea what I'm talking about is called imposter syndrome. Now, to about every millennial in the world, people, in case you wondered, people aged 25 to 39 are millennials. If they're older, they're not millennials. If they're younger, they're not millennials. So just make sure that you're annoyed at the right people. <laughs> <laughs> Knows the word because we feel it, most of us, like all the time, every day. Especially this week. I felt it all the time, every day. Now, imposter syndrome basically means having a consistent feeling of doubting of your abilities and feeling like a fraud. I didn't know that the term actually came, come, started in the 1970s because it's only really become common in like the last 10 years with people who are growing up in my generation. It's basically a really cool term that refers to extreme self-doubt. And people in my age range, Rachel will tell you, we got it back. We spent a lot of time looking for the adult in the room before we realize we are the adults in the room. <laughs> but imposter syndrome at its core represents doubt. Doubt in one's own abilities. It is me saying to myself, yeah, you spent seven years in school. Yes, you have your master's of any degree. Yes, you've been br bred in the church for many years for this. Can you really pastor this church? Can you really handle balancing a budget and coordinating efforts among five churches, doing all these missions and trying to lead the church to do all these new things? Who am I to do this? Am I really qualified for all of this? And on my bad days, in my bad moments, this is what I'm saying to myself internally, and I just tell you, church, this is what most people 40 years or younger feel all the time. And the younger you are, the worse it seems to be. Just ask anyone who has the, um, the, the fortunate position to work with 20-somethings that are just out of college. 
Those people are really crippled at work by self-doubt. Mm -hmm. So in times like these, I have to try to ground myself and remember just how capable I am. One thing that helped me is remembering the words from Paul's letter to Timothy that says, Let no one despise you because of your youth. And remember that even though I am young, even though I may mess things up quite a bit, Jesus can and will still use me. And the evidence of this is all throughout the Gospels. You know, a lot has been made that Jesus himself, during his three years of ministry, was a rather young man. Tradition tells us that he was actually only 33 years old at the time of his murder. But also, most of the apostles, not all of them, but the 12 men that he was closest to, and a lot of the unspecified size-wise group that are just known as the women, were all 30 years old or younger. And there are certain places in the Gospels, especially with the apostles, where this youth and inexperience is highly evident. Now this is something that any teacher or anyone who has spent a lot of time around children can tell you, that if you're in a group and you have, say, 10 to 30 children, you're going to have three or four kids who take up about 75% of your time and attention. Because these are the kids that cause the most trouble. Every former and current teacher are nodding their heads. If you're watching this, you're nodding your head right now. Bethany, if you're watching, I know you're nodding your head right now. <laughs> and in the Gospels, we also have problem children. And their names are Peter, James, and John. <laughs> Think about it. These are the three apostles that get the most play, the most mentions, than any of the other apostles. Heck, there are 12 of these guys, and some of them, we, they just get their name read a few times. Some of them we know absolutely nothing about. Yet, Peter, James, and John get all the play while causing all of the problems. You have James and John who are fighting consistently over who's going to sit at Jesus' right hand in heaven. They have the moment I mentioned last week where they're wondering whose sins the mother or the father caused the, the man to become crippled. Really, Throughout the whole Gospels, they're kind of just buffoons. Now, I was going to talk about these three this week, and just wait. The more and more time we spend together in the four Gospels, the more likely we are going to talk about Peter, James, and John, and all of their nonsense. But for this week, the more and more I looked at our text today, the more I started to look at them, especially Peter, with some different eyes. Because this text features one of, if not the most important question that Jesus ever asked his disciples. And I will take a moment to note, Jesus asks a whole lot of questions. He gives, asks more questions than he really gives answers. And the text says, Let's just say there's three problem children for argument's sake. He's talking just to them. He asks, who do people say I am? And the three of them answer, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But then he gets to the question he really wants to ask. And what about you? Who do you say I am? And well... Remember this, folks, because it doesn't happen often. Peter answers, you are the Christ. Peter got the right answer! <laughs> doesn't get doesn't do this a lot in the Gospels. Oh, goodness. And on such an important question, the question that Jesus asks pretty much all of us every single day, who do you say I am? By the way we live our lives every day, we say who Jesus is in our lives. Is he just a nice guy who had some cool sayings? Is he just the one who had to die for us because we're a bunch of dirty sinners? Or is Jesus the Christ? Word become flesh, God with us. 
We say that with pretty much everything in our lives. So, of course, the big question number one for the week is, who is Jesus in our lives? It's a great question to ask. But, of course, we have a lot more text here, so let's keep going. Then Jesus said to his disciples, The human one must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts, and be killed. And then, after three days, rise from the dead. He said this plainly, the text says. This is the first time in Mark that he's predicted his death. And in retrospect, the fact that it would jar his friends is actually very understandable. But Peter is going to be Peter and go really overboard. The text says that Peter took a hold of Jesus and scolding him, he began to correct him. Oh my. Oh, oh my. Oh my goodness. Just. <clears throat> Jesus then turned and looked at his disciples and sternly corrected Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking God, you are not thinking thought God's thoughts, but human thoughts. And then Jesus gives this big speech that goes like this. All of you who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them. But all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Of course, what Jesus says here becomes the basis of the Christian church. It represents the call that we are all given as Christians. When Jesus speaks of the cross, he doesn't necessarily mean death like most people think. But rather, taking your cross up means putting others before yourselves. It means submitting yourself fully to your call as a Christian. It's the charge that we all have, and one that I hope we all take seriously. But I want to go back to Peter. I've been hard on Peter today. And in past sermons that I preached in te- back in Texas, I've been much harder on him. You see, there's a common view that is held by scholars as to why Peter is so bad that Jesus says he has to go and die at the hands of the chief priest and such and surrounds him. And even though Jesus talks to resurrection, it's one, I think it's one of those situations where you hear the first part of the saying and you get so angry that you don't hear the other part. I think we've all felt like that once before, or maybe more. Because remember, at this time, Jesus commonly has crowds of 5,000 men and women and children who follow him around on almost a daily basis at this point. And these people are following him around for different reasons. Some need healing. Some are overawed by his teachings, and they just can't get enough of it. And some had bigger hopes for Jesus. They were hoping not only that he would transform the religious life of Judea, they were hoping that he would become... Uh, the king of Israel, that he would be be the harbinger of a new David Solomon-esque monarchy that would chase the Roman Empire out of Judea. Because for most people, 5,000 people following you isn't a crowd. It's a potential army. This is the reason, folks, why the Pharisees fear Jesus so much. They got their own plans, you see. And as for the disciples, there is a cynical view that they have thrown everything behind Jesus because they want part of that power. They want to be able to say that I was with Jesus at the start, and we're going to be there when we run this place. (laughs) Of course, Jesus was never concerned with an earthly kingdom only with the kingdom of heaven. 
But some people think this, and I even espouse this view, that when Peter hears Jesus talking about dying and giving up his life, that Peter sees everything crumble. So he grabs Jesus by the scruff of his neck and shakes him because he's angry. He's not going to get all the things that he thinks he's going to get. But I want to back off on that view today, folks. I want to look at things a different way. What if Peter, at this moment, had imposter syndrome? What if upon hearing Jesus make this prediction about his own death, Peter wondered, how is he going to live without Jesus? Mm-hmm. And then Peter's kind of the second in command here. Does that mean that Peter is going to go have to lead this bunch of people? And now in the midst of all of this doubt and insecurity, he acts the fool to the point that Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. People my age, we live with this doubt and insecurity every single day. And I know it's not just, I know it's not just us. But we believe that we're not enough. And I think that some of that pawn scum theology we talked about last week is partly responsible for that. But church, I'm here to tell you first, that doubt is okay. Doubt is just a part of life. But it's when we have doubts that we start to really ask our questions about Jesus. If we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the child of the living God, we have an escape from doubt. We have a way out of doubt. And we say with our lives who we think Jesus is when those hard times that make us doubt come. And of course, we've been living in those hard times for way too long now. But because what Peter didn't know was that, yes, one day Jesus would be killed at the hands of the Roman Empire. But as Johnny Cash says, ain't no grave gonna hold him down. And while Jesus wouldn't always be with Peter in the flesh, Jesus would always be there as Jesus is with us now. And we say that in our times of doubt. When it comes to the biggest ask, the biggest ask that Jesus ever makes of us, when he asks us, who do you say I am? We answer those questions when we have doubt. We answer what comes to how we treat the least of these. We answer in what we do in days that we lived through 20 years ago yesterday, church. And I know where the whole world itself, where the word itself may not be on the lips of those who are over 40, I know we all sometimes struggle with imposter syndrome. We all struggle with the thoughts that we are less that we are not capable. I see it every day in this church, folks. People who, even though they're so capable, even though they're so talented, even though they have a love for Christ that is evident, that I see every day, people in this church are just unsure of themselves. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus is sure of you, folks. Jesus is there for you in your doubts, in your pain, and in your tragedy. After all, Jesus has always been through, already been through it all. He's there to be with you in the dark times. Because remember, with death, and this is the thing that Peter couldn't hear at that time. He was so consumed, he couldn't hear the joy of resurrection. Because it's right there, Jesus says... I will return in three days. But Peter couldn't hear it at that time. So many of us can't hear about resurrection in our hearts. But in your doubt, I ask you to remember that Jesus is with you. You know what Peter did it. That Jesus will always, is always with us, even in our darkest days. And yes, especially in your doubt. Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose.
Amen. Amen. And now we'll stand for our little hymn here.